of a triple kicks with two double kicks. So in, in uh, Lagrangian, you can write down the term like uh, H transpose uh, I tau 2 tau H times delta. This is a triplet. This is also a triplet. Yeah, and the delta is a common parameter here. And you can find that this has a mass dimension 1, this is mass dimension 1, this is mass dimension 1, so uh, all together should be mass dimension 4, this has dimension of mass. So mass dimension 1. So it's the dimension of the part. By the way, uh, you probably uh, wouldn't be surprised if somebody says that H dagger tau H is a triplet. Tau is uh, 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 the Pauli matrices, uh, Pauli matrices in the isospin uh, space. I think uh, Grosjean uh, called them sigma, yeah? like uh, usual. Uh, well, sometimes people like to separate normal spin from isospin. That's the same Pauli matrices, but just not in the spin space, but the, in the isospin space. And some people call them tau instead of uh, sigma, but they are just exactly the same, just acting in a different so if you have expression like this, for example, H dagger H, you will say that's a singlet of S I2. Okay? Or if you have H dagger tau H, you say it's a triplet, okay? a vector. However, if you look at this, it's not completely obvious that H transpose I tau 2 tau H is a vector. In order to see that, you should prove that H dagger and H transpose I tau 2 tau, I tau 2, sorry, uh, transform on the SE2 in exactly the same way. And that's another exercise for you. Okay. To prove that H transpose I tau 2 transforms in the same way as H dagger. So if H transpose as E alpha tau H, oh, tau H dagger transformed as uh, H dagger times exponential minus I alpha tau, okay? Obviously. And so tau is a, tau over two is a generator of other spin and flavor space. Alpha are three parameters, so alpha is a vector. So H and H dagger are transformed in an obvious way. And therefore, H, H dagger is a singlet. Okay. Now, the exercise is to show that H transpose I at tau 2 transforms exactly in the same way as H dagger. And therefore, this expression is also a vector, an exercise. You need to remember the properties of the power matrices of this. Okay. Next, so if uh, the equations please ask, then I move to this. This is corresponding for F U2 to not correct for F U M. This is only for M, right? Equal to. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, let me move on. We go to neutrino oscillations. Well, neutrinos, as we know, can oscillate, which means that they can periodically change their, their flavor. Electron and neutrino will go to mu neutrino, then again electron, so on and so forth. And this happens without any external influence. We are used to the situations when particles change their identity with, when they interact with each other, when they collide, or when they decay. Here, the situation is different. Without any external influence at all, all of a sudden, Particles start changing their identity in a periodic way, which may look very strange. It's like Mr. Jekyll, uh, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde kind of story. Uh, here it's even more complicated. It's not a two-sided uh, identity, but a three-sided identity at least. Okay. Uh, and for in the simplest case of two, just two neutrino flavor, 
This is the master formula. The probability of neutrino oscillation between two flavors as a function of distance between the neutrino production and detection point has this simple form. I will discuss it more uh, later on. So I'll just give you the idea, okay? And hints for neutrino oscillations were coming from the uh, solar neutrino experiments for a long time, even though the conclusions were not very strong and the evidence was not very strong. And the first unambiguous evidence for neutrino oscillations came from the atmospheric neutrino experiments in 1998, as already uh, mentioned to you before. Okay. Uh, what's Sorry? What is the What is one? The P was Theta? No, no. No question? Okay. Now, a little bit of history. As I said, the idea of neutrino oscillations was first, first uh, put forward by Pantecoro in 1957, and Pantecoro uh, considered neutrino oscillations between uh, neutrinos and their own antiparticles, because at that time it was not known that there were more than one neutrino species. And he used the analogy with oscillations of neutral K mesons. And the flavor transitions, which were called in that paper by virtual transmutation, so it's not completely obvious that the oscillations of a man, were first mentioned in the paper by Maki, Nakago, and Sakata in 1962, just two weeks after the discovery of, of the muon neutrino. was submitted to publication two weeks after the discovery of the muon neutrino. And here you see the authors of this beautiful idea, Bruno Pantecoro, Shuichi, Sakata, Zero Maki, and Masami Nakakao. Now, since then, neutrino oscillations have been discovered and firmly established in experiments with solar neutrinos, with atmospheric neutrinos, uh, with the accelerators, uh, accelerators, and with reactor neutrinos. And I will discuss all these uh, experiments later in one of my uh, next lectures. Now, how can we understand that neutrinos can change their identity? Even though this may look mysterious, that's actually a very well-known quantum mechanical phenomenon. You can find it in any or nearly any textbook of quantum mechanics. Assume you have, for example, a two-state quantum system with energies E1 and E2 and the wave functions Psi1 and Psi2. Now, if we consider the time evolution of these uh, uh, wave functions, it has a very simple form. So Psi1 gets a phase factor with time exponential minus I E1 times T, and the same for Psi2. However, if we manage to create a state which is not one of these two eigenstates of the system, but a linear superposition of them, then the time evolution of the system will be more complicated. So assume we have such a linear superposition, which is A times Psi1 plus B times Psi2, and we created it at time zero and the coefficients a squared uh, plus b squared sum to unity to uh, satisfy the normalization condition. Then at a later time, of course, each of these states will uh, pick up a phase factor which corresponds to this evolution, exponential minus i uh, e1 t and exponential minus i e2 t. Okay? However, if we want to find what is the probability of this system to remain in the initial state, we have to project this evolved state onto the initial state and take the square modulus of the, uh, this projection according to the laws of quantum mechanics. Very simple. And if you do that, we take this square modulus and we immediately find that the probability of finding your system in the original state oscillates with time. With an amplitude which is proportional to the product of coefficients a and b, so if any of them is zero, there will be no oscillations. If we have a pure state instead of mixed state original, there will be no oscillations. And the frequency of this oscillation is given by one half of the energy difference of these two eigenstates. So you can find it practically in any textbook of quantum mechanics. And neutrino oscillations is just a simple consequence of the same thing. 
The point is that neutrinos which are produced or detected uh, are produced or detected through the charge current wing interactions. And the charge current wing interactions uh, are not the ideal state of the full Hamiltonian of your problem. Because uh, there is no, when you diagonalize the charge current mass interact, uh, uh, sorry, charge current with interaction, the mass term is non diagonal and vice versa. So you cannot diagonalize both terms simultaneously. So the neutrinos which are produced in the charge current interactions or detected in this interaction, they are not mass eigen states. And for the same reason, this means that they are actually mixed states of, of, of the um, Lagrangian of free propagation. And therefore, uh, neutrino state produced as a flavor state, which means I guess state of the weak interaction, oscillate with time, all this space. Since we know that it's very difficult to stop neutrinos, they always want to move. So as I mentioned before, we cannot simultaneously diagnose the charge current, the Lagrangian, and the mass Lagrangian. Therefore, we can write down uh, using the for the product of the left-handed rotation, which diagonalizes the um, matrices of charged leptons and neutrinos by matrix U, we can write down the uh, flavor state, which are electron, muon, and power state of neutrinos, uh, as a linear superposition of mass eigen states. And the coefficient of this super linear superposition are given uh, exactly by this matrix. And for, for this is for the field, and for this vector of states, we get a similar relation, except that we get complex conjugate uh, factors here. And using this, we can derive this so-called standard formula for the oscillation probability uh, of neutrinos in vacuum. Here, uh, it's very easy to understand what's actually, what means what. This term here projects the initially produced neutrino of flavor A, or alpha, alpha may be electron muon and power neutrino, project it onto the mass eigenstate basis. This term gives you the propagation in the mass eigenstate basis, the phases obtained by different mass eigenstate uh, components of the flavor state. And then after the evolution, we project it back, back on the flavor basis onto the flavor of state beta. Then we take the square models of this, um, this expression. And this gives us the oscillation probability. Now, a little bit in more detail on how this can be derived. Assume that at time zero and at the coordinate x equal to zero, a flavor eigenstate nu a is produced. Okay? So nu alpha is produced. And it can be written, as I said, as a linear superposition of uh, mass eigenstates. And at time t and at coordinate x, each of the state obtains a fact phase vector, which is not just minus I, I, exponential minus I energy times T, because neutrinos are not at rest, they move. Therefore, we, can, we should take into account also the contribution to the oscillation phase coming from the, the difference of the coordinates. And essentially, what we have here is a product of two four vectors, the four vector of the momentum of the mass eigenstate I and the coordinate of the mass eigenstate uh, uh, coordinate uh, propagated uh, by this uh, part for vector, which means time and, and space coordinate. So the phase phi, which enters here, is even given by this product of four vectors, which is ET minus PX, the dot vector dot product. Yeah. And then we take, project this onto some flavor state, take the square of the modulus of the projection, and we get the oscillation probability. Now, how can we calculate the oscillation phase? So that's actually very simple, and unfortunately, there are many wrong approaches to calculation of the oscillation phase. Let me just give you the right one, even though a little bit simplified, just in a couple of lines. So what we should do here? First of all, let's consider one-dimensional problem. Let's cons assume that the momentum of neutrino is aligned with a with a vector between the uh, neutrino source and detector, which is a very good, very good approximation if neutrinos propagate macroscopic distances and the source and detector are relatively small. Okay? So it simplifies the things which makes it one dimensional. Instead of three dimensional vectors, we have one dimensional. Okay? Next, let us 
remember that we always deal with relativistic neutrinos, so we have to use this formula. And the energies and momentum of different mass eigenstates forming the flavor state are very close to each other. Neutrinos, uh, neutrino energy is much bigger than mass and the mass difference of different neutrinos. And therefore, their energies and momenta are very, very close to each other of different mass eigenstates which enter into the flavor state. And let's expand the energy difference in terms of momentum difference and mass difference. So we write that delta E is dE over dP times delta P plus dE over dM squared times delta M squared. And using this formula, we get, first of all, dE over dP is just the, the group velocity of the neutrino state, neutrino wave pattern, actually. So I write it, group velocity Vg times delta P. And from this formula, we find that delta E over delta M squared is just 1 over 2E. So we get Vg delta P plus delta M squared over 2E. From this formula, we can express delta P is given by this expression and plug it back into the formula for the phase difference. If we do this, we find the following formula. There is a term which is so-called standard neutrino oscillation phase, which enters into all these master formulas which I discussed before for the oscillation probability. And there is some extra term. Okay? Now look, let us look at this extra term. It contains the factor t minus x over dg. Now, if neutrino was point-like, then it would move along a classical trajectory which corresponds to x equal to vgt. So this term would be absent. In reality, neutrino is not point-like. It's described by a wave packet of finite size. However, in all practical situations, except maybe one very special situation which I may discuss or maybe at the last lecture, in all practical situations, the size of neutrino wave packet is much, much smaller than all the sizes of interest in our problem, than the size of this neutrino source, the size of the neutrino detector, and the distance between the source and the detector. Therefore, we can neglect the size of the neutrino wave packet in this situation and assume it to be point-like. But if we do this, we just neglect this term, this term will be negligible. It can be shown, actually I will discuss it probably later, that this assumption, that this term can be neglected, is related to the coherence of neutrino production and detection. So if neutrino production and detection is coherent, then this third term is negligible. And in this case, we end up with a standard phase for neutrino oscillations in vacuum. And if we use this expression in the formula which I discussed before, we just get this uh, result here. And which leads to this master formula? Yeah. Maybe there is a mystery there. L times for I versus G. Do versus G. I for I versus G. Yes. Is it a mystery or I? Some more I, this is IJ. Yeah? Yes, so I for I versus G. Do versus G. You, J. You, ah, you. versus G. Ah, yes, right. No, I'm uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I. I, 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 I yes, delta right. I, delta M, I, G. I. Delta M squared, I, G. No. Ah, uh, delta M squared, I, G. But U, beta, I. And U, alpha, G. I. There is some over some I and J. There is some, some over I, I and J is arbitrary. Hmm? J is arbitrary. It's not some over. The reason is, Instead of J, you can take one. I will take one, you will, you will take two and one. The result will be the same. Because ah, you have a square modulus. Ah, because of unitarity. Square modulus, no, not in unitarity. Because of the square modulus. Don't confuse students. differ by 
than one square minus n two square, which is constant. And because of the square models, you take it out of the models, and it disappears. It's a constant phase, which is irrelevant. J, instead of J, I could have written one here, or two, or three. The result will be the same. Very easy. I suggest everyone to check this as an, another exercise. That J, I can take anything for J here in this form, oh, sorry. Uh, I can take anything for J, can take one, can take two, can take three, and nothing will change. Moreover, I cannot have I here and J here, just because mass eigenstate do not go into each other. If I project it on the mass eigenstate basis, the mass eigenstate I will propagate as mass eigenstate of I, it will not become mass eigenstate J, never. Therefore, here I and here I, not I and J. And J here is absolutely irrelevant. You can, instead of J, you can take any one of them, but fixed one. You don't sum away. So an exercise for you to check that the result doesn't depend on what I take for J. And what is K? Sorry? Yeah, L, uh, L is a distance propagated by neutrino. That's the distance between the neutrino production point and detection point. Okay, let me see where I should stop. So, the problem is also to derive this expression from the formulas I, I, I showed you before. And maybe at this point, before going to the two flavor example, I will stop and ask for questions. Is it right? A few minutes for questions. So can we simultaneously measure mass and flavor of neutrinos? Can we simultaneously measure mass and flavor of neutrinos? Mass and flavor? Yes, mass and flavor. Well, uh, no, I don't think we can do it simultaneously. Of course, we, we, we measure mass Indirect. For example, in neutrino oscillation experiments, we measure flavor, for sure. We detect neutrinos only of, of certain flavor. Yeah? So we measure flavor. And we measure the mass square difference because the oscillation probability depends on the mass square difference. But in oscillation experiments, we cannot measure the mass itself. The mass scale we cannot measure in the oscillation experiments. Only mass square differences. But we can do it in the oscillation. In the principle, yeah, like if, you you want to mechanics, if you measure mass, then flavor is not known. Right. Or if you know flavor, mass is not known. Right, right. That, that's correct. But uh, in, in a sense, indirectly, what we do is we can measure the flavor and the muscular difference. Let, let me ask this, the same question in a different way. When C was indicated to neutrino and neutrino, it's flavor neutrino mass. So, so this is when you produce uh, in the was in decay neutrino and neutrino. You yes. produce flavor neutrino <coughs> or a basic neutrino. In, no. we, in, we, in which <laughs> No, we, pro we produce always a flavor neutrino. Always. Yes, yes, yes. So, well, well, there is another question. For example, we say that we distinguish between neutrino and anti neutrino. Okay? Now, the question is if they are Majorana particles, how can we distinguish between neutrino and anti neutrino? We say, for example, in neutron beta decay, an electron antineutrino is produced. But the process in which, for example, Davis used for the uh, uh, detection of solar neutrinos, which was nu e plus uh, uh, chlorine. So only electron neutrino can participate, not electron antineutrino. Uh, that was, by the way, in one of the Davis early experiments, in which he tried to detect electron antineutrinos produced at the detector in this experiment, and he failed. He didn't see any signal. And then people say that 
these are different particles, neutrino and antineutrino. And no, but if it is true that they are different particles, then they probably cannot be Majorana particles. If they are, since Majorana particles uh, coincide with their own other particle. So do we really know that neutrinos are not Majorana particles because of distinction between these particles or not? So does anyone know the answer? So I, I was saying that if we consider, for example, uh, neutron decay, We call this particle an antineutrino. And particle which was uh, detected by Davis in his solar neutrino experiment, we call the neutrino. And Davis actually tried at the reactor to detect these particles with this experiment, and he failed. And he concluded that uh, these are different particles. We call them neutrino and antineutrino, actually. Does it mean that we have uh, established that neutrinos are Dirac particles, that neutrinos and antineutrinos are different? Or does anyone know the answer? Any suggestion? Not, not from senior members. So. <laughs> okay, then after party. Huh? <laughs> so the question is of in beta decay, antineutrino electron is produced, yes? Antineutrino electron. It's not my rare particle. It is not antineutrino. Neutrino, antineutrino, just the same. Why antineutrino electron produced not beta decay? Doesn't include this reality. Because why this antineutrino particle produced in beta decay does not produce uh, this reality? This is the question. Yeah. Right, yeah, right. Maybe it was not clear enough. Once again, we know that there are some particles emitted in neutron decay which we call antineutrino. And we know that these particles cannot induce this reaction. And therefore, they say that this is neutrino, this is antineutrino, and they are different, different particles. So if they are different, it may look that they cannot be Majorana then. It cannot be Majorana. So is it correct that we excluded experimentally that neutrino is a Majorana particle or not? But you know the answer. <laughs> you should know the answer. Why antineutrino doesn't produce this reaction? Okay, uh, after... <laughs> okay, let, let, let us... Ne next lecture I'll ask you for the answer. Try to think about that. Uh, can, can you take a microphone? Because uh, I can... Is it just a separate particle? 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 Is it tested that antineutrino can produce this reaction? It was an experiment by Davis himself before he started uh, looking for solar neutrinos. Yeah, so I know. He tried detector with <coughs> perfluoroethylene with chlorine 37, put it near the reactor in which these kind of neutrinos are produced, and tried to find these neutrinos, and he failed. So it is experimentally tested that this particle doesn't produce, doesn't participate in this reaction. Well, there is, a, there is a lepton violation, isn't it? Isn't there? Okay. Because, because uh, Okay, the so, so the conclusion should be since lepton, not lepton flavor, lepton number. Right? Lepton number, yes. And it doesn't happen, therefore, lepton number should be conserved and neutrino must be my Dirac particles. Is that the correct conclusion or no? Well, it cannot be my error. Well, I guess. Think a little bit more about that, and we can discuss it in the next lecture. <laughs>